Breaking news! We have LEDs installed on the robot matching our color scheme at the school. Very cool. As you can see, they are connected to our candle, which is directly wired into the CAN system. This allows us full RGB control on our arm. My name is Max, and I worked with I worked on the lift aspect of this robot. There's a few main aspects of this lift that help the team to achieve their goal of scoring the GameCube elements into the grid. So at first, at the base here, we have a uh, Neo motor that's hooked up to a 100 to 1 planetary gearbox with an additional 12 to 22 gear reduction going from the chain and sprocket, which allows us to change the position of the arm itself while making a scoring attempt. The lift also uses a climber in the box, which uses constant force springs as a means of actuating a linear slide within the extruded aluminum in order to change the length of the arm itself, as well as a spool that uses a Neo 550 geared at 21 to 1 uh, to spool up rope inside of the arm itself in order to bring it back in closer to the robot, which allows us to comply with the 48 inch uh, out of frame perimeter requirement step by first. Okay, so we invented uh, this picker upper uh, and it's run by a pneumatic cylinder, it goes in and out, it has these hooks. Uh, we never got them to work 100% perfectly, but they do work, the concept's there, a little bit more developing uh, is probably needed. But so the hooks are for picking them up, the cone on its side. Um, you just drive into it, and then this little latch uh, latches the cone in, and then it can't fall out. And then when you set it on, the, you just back up, and then the pole will be above it, and will take the cone from the hook. Um, and you'll also, while it's in here, get a clamp, and this bar with this one, kind of align it. Um, and then you can also pick up the cone by clamping when it's in the upright position. pick it up, set it in the pedestals. Um, we found about 15, 20 PSI is where nothing broke at and clamp these cubes pretty good because if you clamp this too hard, uh, I'm sure it would pop. We never popped one, but. So my name's Isaac. Um, I'll be talking about the drivetrain chassis we're using for this for our robot this year. So this year we're using Swerve Drive Specials Mark IV-I. Basically that just means that the motors are mounted underneath the frame of the robot instead of on top of the robot. We, are, we did mount our frame upside down on the robot so we can have the four inches of clearance to get onto the balance board. Uh, also along the lines of the balance board we're using a 20 by 30 inch frame which is thinner than a standard kit of parts frame so you can more easily fit three robots onto the balance board if you need to. Hello, Lucas back on. I'm here to talk about the electronics on our robot over here. Uh, we have a variety of electronics we are using this year. Uh, first of all, as, uh, as shown, we have our beautiful Alkin motors. Uh, these sport a uh, built-in encoder on the bottom. Very cool. Uh, it allows the swerve drive to know where it's at. Also up here, this is a third encoder. We have one, two, three for each module that figures out where it is. Uh, we have that in all four spots. And then if you come over here, take a look. 
at here with our Neo engines. Uh, these guys are pretty cool. We have two brushless motors that are powering our big arm up front. Uh, these guys are going to be uh, powered by our Spark Maxes. Sorry for the mess, but it's just how it goes. Uh, also, these guys uh, have an encoder built into them, uh, so we can have more control over everything. Uh, if you take a look over here, we have our limit switches, magnetic limit switches right here to ensure that we do not damage our frame when moving our arm. Very, very important. Uh, otherwise, we have some of the classics, you know, we got our uh, compressor tank for the whole pneumatic setup at the front. Uh, and then right here, uh, the Nav X, the heart of our drive, uh, sporting a gyroscope and accelerometer. This allows us to know where the robot is in space. Otherwise, that's all. Hello everyone, I will be talking about the mechanical aspects of the robot that we would have liked to have changed during our build or would recommend changing for teams looking to do a design similar to ours. So to start off, we'll talk about our telescoping arm. We did a two-stage telescoping arm or a one-moving stage telescoping arm. I would highly recommend adding more stages to that arm so that it would be more compact and fully stored. That seemed to cause a lot of issues with our mounting. We were actually only able to mount it in one exact spot on the robot, which is where we mounted it one inch above the swerve drive modules in order to stay within frame but also be able to reach our full extension to place the cone in the top goal. So doing a one stage lift is actually extremely difficult and it's going to cause a lot of issues for teams who try to implement it because you'll have to have that arm sticking way outside your frame and bumpers to intake uh, both cubes and cones. So implementing a multi-stage lift will help a lot. It will also allow you to mount the arm in different locations. We would really like to mount the arm in a higher up location, maybe a foot taller. Uh, that would allow us to have a counterweight on the back end of the arm so that it wasn't so front heavy. This created a ton of torque on the mounting and we actually went through quite a few gearboxes um, trying to get this tuned just right. We ended up running that Neo at roughly 200 to 1 ratio and at about 20% speed in order to get what we were looking for on that arm. And I would highly suggest teams look into either implementing constant force springs, gas springs, or even uh, rotary springs, anything to get rid of some of the torque that's being applied through that drive system. And then also trying to minimize the backlash in that system. We had a ton of backlash in the top half, as you can see in some of our videos, and the arm and that made our control a lot more difficult in our PID tuning. So implementing a way of either direct driving that with a, sh a direct drive shaft or doing a different gearing system would allow you to do that. We also are aware that we mounted our swerve drives a little bit differently than is suggested. We mounted the 1x2 on top of the top um, bracket on the Mark IV eyes and then moved the bottom brace to the top of the 1x2. I don't know that this is technically recommended by swerve drive specialties, and I, I believe that the spacer is the incorrect size to fit that, but we made it work and it allowed us to have a much bigger ground clearance without the bumpers on. When you add the bumpers on, I would highly suggest putting them at max height so that you never have to worry about bottoming out on the balance platform. Uh, on the intake side, we did go with a simple grab design. We couldn't figure out a way to easily implement a rolly grabber intake into a design in three days. I would highly suggest teams look into ways to touch and own game pieces. In general, having a wide area of acquisition for a pincher type intake will, I think, be effective this year. One thing we also try to minimize was the width of our robot. This uh, allows you to more easily fit three robots on the platform. This was done with some math that show that essentially there's only one inch of play with three kit bots. So any inch you take away from the width of your drive base this year is going to be another inch of play that you have with your two other teammates to get onto that platform. So we did 20 by 30 robot, but I would highly suggest trying to minimize that width dimension of your robot. Um, another thing on our intake is picking up cones that are tipped down. 
we didn't quite figure out and quite implement a way to be able to pick up cones that are both tip down and then right side up. I highly suggest teams also look into ways to tip up cones that are tip down. I think there's a lot of possibilities there and we were actually able to do that with our current design, you know, driving over cones and tipping them upright so that we can grab them with our pincher and place them. Alright, so I'm going to be talking about some of the things that we would change software wise with the robot. To start, I just kind of want to clear up some information on the library we use for the Swerve Drive modules. Um, so if you go to the 2022 library, and in order to install it, you actually need to download the .json file. It is labeled sdsswervelib.json. You're going to want to download that and put it into a folder under C Users Public WPI Lib 2023 and Vendor Depths. It might be if you if you installed the WPI Lib under just the user setting instead of the public, um, it'd be under whatever that username is. So it would be C Users Name of your user WPI Lib 2023 Vendor Depths. So it just depends on how you ended up actually downloading WPI Lib. For us, it was under public, so once we did that and we got that file, we saved it to there, we just installed it like it was an offline vendor library. So we went into um, VS Code and we did Control Shift P and we installed a new offline vendor library and it popped up for us. We were able to install it. So there was a couple questions on that, so I just wanted to clear that up here. And then let's get into some of the things we would have actually changed with the robot or added to the robot more. Um, to start with this, I don't know how necessary it is, but it's a good feature to have for sure. It'd be auto leveling. Um, we did have a nav export on the robot, so we were going to use that to auto level onto the charge station. We just didn't end up getting around to it, nor did we really find it too important once we got done with testing. Um, but definitely something that I don't think would be that hard to implement and definitely might be something that might interest some teams. Um, another thing that we could have done is used the limelight to do some vision tracking on the targets, um, both the April tags and also the retro reflectives. We just didn't really have time to get around to this. Um, I think it would be definitely beneficial, especially with the swerve drive, being able to move side to side to line up with the goal and probably would have made scoring faster. Um, I don't think it's as necessary as like in past years, but I think it's definitely useful for teams to look into at least and then we see how much it's going to be beneficial for them. Another thing that we thought might be useful is we put the LEDs on the robot pretty late in the process, but a good way for teams to communicate with your human players of what game piece you want, whether it be a cube or a cone, would be to change the color of the LEDs. So put them to yellow for a cone, for example, or like the bluish purple for the wanting a cube to be entered into the field. It's a good way to communicate across the field fast and effectively. It's just something we kind of thought of too late in the process, but it should be very easy for teams to implement um, into their code if they're already doing LEDs with a candle or a blinking or whatever your means of using um, LEDs are. Finally, the last thing we would change is kind of the motion control with the arm and the elevator or boom. It was very hard for us to get it done in the time in the way that the arm is built itself to really effectively PID tune it for our capabilities. We also just didn't end up having the time to do so. Um, but I think something that would be very beneficial is being able to have preset positions for the elevator, or I'm sorry, the arm to go to, and even the elevator to go out as well, um, to make scoring faster and a lot easier on your drivers. Another thing with that is we had plans and we had the equations figured out for our arm and elevator to stay within that 48 extension from the frame. We had um, equations figured out to keep that within that 48 inches throughout the whole process, as well as the max height at six foot six. Um, but once again, we just didn't have time to implement that. Also, as it'll probably get talked about in the mechanical part of this video, there was kind of some slop in the top of the arm that just made some of the PID tuning just a little more kind of cautious with doing and we just at the, decided that in the end mechanical and manual control of the arm was going to be the best case for us to go. Um, but definitely with a little more tuning on the mechanical side and also just taking the time to build up the motion control and also have PID tuning for the arm and elevator is going to be definitely beneficial and really cut down on those cycle times. Um, but besides that, that's about all we had for our 
software side of changing stuff or what we would do, but very happy with the team and what we ended up having.